1 Corinthians chapter number 9. We'll begin reading verse number 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And now the Apostle Paul writing here to the church at Corinth. We don't have time to get into what he was talking about in the beginning of chapter number 9. I mean, he starts off asking, am I not an apostle? And then he goes on to say, ye are the proof that I'm an apostle because y'all got saved by the doctrine that I preached because he, he said, have not seen Jesus Christ? Right? That was the main criticism of people said, what? Paul wasn't one of the 12 disciples. No, but he met Jesus on the road to Damascus one day. But we don't, we don't have time to get into all that. Okay. But down here in verse number 19, he's saying, For though I be free from all men, that's what salvation really did for you. Yeah. It made you free from the law of sin, but it also made you free from man. Because, I mean, we can go back to the law in the Old Testament. In the law, there were masters that were set over the tribes of the children of Israel. There was the high priest who was the master over the priests. Right? We had rules and obligations that were structures that were set in place. Sin is what brought things like slavery into the world. Sin is what brought, you know, a whole bunch of wickedness. But kings and kings and warlords and everything else came about because of sin. Well, now I'm free from all men. Why do you think that through the Crusades, as they called them, or the Spanish Inquisition, or the cleansings that the so-called church tried to uh, eradicate those that were unbelievers? No, they were trying to kill people that didn't believe in infant baptism and believed in soul liberty. That's us, if you believe the Bible. Amen. Thankfully, God promised you always have a remnant. They didn't succeed. But those that were facing persecution were being, you know, faced with burning at the stake, were being faced with their family being killed if they didn't repent. Why were they able to stand there? Because God had made them free from man. They no longer served man. They served God. In our sin, we are slaves to other people's opinions. In our sin, we are subject to what other people truly think of us. Right? Because that's how we base are standing in the world. Well, what does somebody else think of me? Right? And then all those things influence your opinion of yourself. Right? You define yourself based off of how other people define you. Paul's saying, no, no, no. I've been made free from all men. I'm a joint heir with Christ. He sees me robed in his righteousness. My opinion of myself now doesn't depend on others. It depends on what God thinks of me. Where in times past, we were outside looking at it. We didn't understand all this religious, this spiritual experience that's called salvation. Now on the inside, we get, oh, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks except what Jesus thinks. Doesn't matter what the world, doesn't even matter what other Baptists may think. Doesn't matter what other Bible believers think. Doesn't matter what people in this room think. All that matters is what God thinks. Yet, verse number 19 goes on to say, have I made myself servant unto all? He's saying, God made me free from everybody else, but I make myself a servant to all. I choose not to wave my liberty, soul liberty, in their face. Not to wave my forgiveness of sins in the face of others and gloat about it. No, I choose to make myself a servant unto everyone. That I might gain the more he's saying some people haven't caught on yet but the apostle Paul had you win more when you serve more you catch more flies with honey than vinegar he's saying when you understand that there's a need then you can fill that need you must serve then he goes on to say in verse number 20, 
under the Jews, he became as a Jew. That he might win the Jews. Them that are under the law, as under the law. Those that are without the law, he became as without the law. I want to stop there for a second, because he clarifies it, because he knew that people were going to make this argument. Doesn't mean that if you want to win the world, you've got to live like the world. He's talking about those that were not. They may have been Hebrew, or they may not have been Hebrew, but they didn't believe in the law that God had passed down. They were living a life, maybe in a different religion, maybe just, you know, backslid on the things of God. They were living, maybe like the prodigal son down in the pig pen. But what he's saying is, I became as those that didn't consider the law as their final authority. In other words, he's saying, I understood them, all of those people, including the weak, to the weak became I as weak, then I might win the weak. He's saying, when I became as them, in other words, I understood what they needed. He's not saying, I didn't live like them, because he was called to be of a chosen generation, to live a separated life unto God. The Apostle Paul's not throwing any of that away. What he's saying is, I got down on my knees, and ask God and beg God to show me what each one of those people needed. Lord, open my eyes to understand what they're looking for. Because how can you serve unless you know what somebody needs? That is the definition of service. To meet a need. To do for someone else, whether they ask you to or not, for their betterment. Because service has nothing to do with the servant. It has to do with the one being served. He's saying, Lord, show me what the Jews need. Show me what the Gentiles need. Lord, in my heart, let me understand what it is that they desire to see in Christ. Because that's the beauty of Christ. He was perfect. There's always something to see. But see, for instance, let's just let's take a little detour here for a second. To the Jews, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the one that proved that he was who the prophet said he would be. The Apostle Paul, if he were standing in the synagogue to a whole bunch of people that their entire life said that here's the law, one day there's going to be one that will come and fulfill the law. He said, well yeah, that one came and fulfilled it and now we're no longer under the law. Christ was the one that he said he was, the Son of God. And he came this time as a lamb, but next time he's coming as Lord to set up his throne and reign for a thousand years. That's a different message than somebody that's a Gentile. But what's a Gentile need to hear? Well, first they need to understand that their gods are blind, deaf, have arms they can't reach, can't talk. They're just made out of you know, inanimate objects given a form, but really they're empty. He's saying, Lord, show those folks that Jesus is the God, the only one that has power. To the weak. He may be talking about those that are weak physically. I mean, the Apostle Paul had the ability, the spiritual gift, to heal others. Maybe some weak need to know that Jesus is the one that can cure their weakness in the flesh. Maybe others are weak emotionally. Maybe they've been abused their entire life. Maybe they need to know well, Lord, they need to understand that you've got a balm of Gilead and that you love them with an everlasting love, that you care about them more than they can even understand what love is. You loved them so much that you gave your only begotten son. Maybe that's the message that the Apostle Paul needed to preach to the weak. Now you say, okay. He became as all those other things. Well, it's one thing to understand it. It's another thing to go out and to meet that need. It's one thing for me to say, well, here's the situation. Here's what the problem is. Here's how Jesus can fix it. How are they going to hear about it unless you go tell them? Do you understand that a whole lot of the Apostle Paul's life after that road to Damascus experience was traveling, going to different people? I don't know if your Bible is one of them that in the back it's got the maps that will show you the missionary journey. It's an estimate. Nobody knows for sure. I mean, they might have taken a different detour out on the water. I don't, I don't know. God could have told Paul, hey, go over to that, that island, preach to them barbarians. I don't know. But that's a general estimate. We know that he went to all these places. We don't know maybe where he went along the way. But a whole lot of his life 
was spent away from comfort. Amen. Was spent away from the things that he knew. A whole lot of his life was dusty roads with sandals on, walking from one place to another. A whole lot of his life was, once he got there, he preached things that they didn't like, and he ended up either getting stoned or thrown in jail or beaten, and he kept on going. Why? Because he was in the service of others. Now, if we're honest, I mean, we can go. We don't have time to go there because if we ended up going to all these different places, we'd be here until you know midnight. And I don't want to pull an Apostle Paul and somebody fall out of the pew and then die because I can't raise you up from the dead. Okay. But other passages where the Apostle Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's a reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? Because in service to the Lord, if I serve God, I will serve others. Because it is the will of God that we serve others. But how do you know that? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What did Christ Jesus do when he was born of a virgin? He took on a robe of flesh, but he took on the form of a servant. He came as him, not his Lord this time. Next time, he's coming as Lord. Those that saw a glimpse of him said, oh, you're him. He said, yeah, but here, I'm here to serve and do the will of my Father. But I'm here also to serve so that others can come to know the Father. Well, if we're supposed to be Christ-like, we've got to serve. And then, understanding that we must serve, there's the question of whom do we serve? Well, a lot of people say that they serve God, but God isn't anywhere near the stuff that they're doing. Many where there'll be that say, Lord, didn't I preach here and prophesy in thy name? Cast out devil, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. There's so a lot of people that claim it. There's a lot of other people that might be on their way to heaven. But the thing that they're serving, they may claim that they're serving God, but are they serving self? Are they serving others, but are they more interested in what others think than what God thinks of them? Then you're not serving the Lord, you're serving people. Are they serving their job more than they're serving the Lord? A lot of things you can serve once you become a servant. But see, here's the thing. In serving others, we've already talked about it, you become bound to others. You no longer care about what you want, you desire. All that you care about is what that other person thinks. In serving an idea or a concept, you become a fanatic. I mean, you don't believe me. Go watch any sporting game. Those people are nuts. I don't, I don't care that much about... I like players. I like coaches. But if, you know, somebody loses... I wasn't heartbroken when Clemson lost the national championship. Still woke up the next day. Didn't cry myself to sleep. But I didn't call in and take the day off of work. Say I need a mental health day. No. But there are some people that are that obsessed. And it may not be... A football team. It may be a new fad, a new, you know, I'm sort of looking for, a new movement in society that they get so attached to. There are people that literally every election cycle will call in and like use up all their vacation time they saved for four years to go and help somebody else campaign. Well, I'm just going to pray for who God wants me to vote for, and that's who I'm going to vote for. And if somebody asks me, I'm going to tell them, but I'm not going to go out and give my life over to somebody else who, in the end, may not win, and let's be honest, more than likely, is about half wicked. But there are those that do. Why do they do it? Because they feel like through serving something else, that's what adds value to their life. Well, then you become a slave to that thing. I still go back and watch all those videos of all those people in New York City bawling their eyes out at the Hillary Clinton rally when they were like, oh, she'll be on stage in 20 minutes. She's got this thing locked up. Hour later, two hours later. Why were those people so upset? Because they bought in. They became servants to it. But not noble servants. They became slaves to the, the idea. 
to the teacher. They bought into the dogma. There are people that buy into other people. And I'm, I'm not saying that it hadn't happened to me, but for some, we invest in other people, and when those people die, we get heartbroken, and it does damage to us. doesn't do damage to them. But in service to God, I can serve others, and am I going to get hurt? Sometimes. Am I going to fail? Sometimes. Are there going to be times that I plant and never see the increase? Yeah. Are there going to be times that I water and never see the increase? Yeah. But in all of it, I've got God's stamp of approval on my life. Because really what he says here, that I serve others, he's saying, I serve Christ. Why did he go to Galatia? Why did he go to Corinth? Because God told him to. Why did he write this letter back to him? Because God told him to. We see throughout the Apostle Paul's epistles that he had a heart for all of these churches. He wanted to be at each and every one of them all the time, but he knew that he couldn't. He wanted God to bless all of them greatly. I mean, look down at verse number 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. In other words, he's saying, I become servants to others so that churches like y'all who support me can reap and can gain even more. He's saying, I served you so that God would get the increase, but those that sent me to you got a piece of that. He's saying, I know you're dependent on me. You're counting in me. I don't want to let you guys down either so that the gospel can grow and that you can get a reward for it in heaven. He's saying, it's not just about me. It's about everybody that's invested in me. He's saying, there's a lot of people that through service reap the reward. And nowhere in here does he say that he wants the crown, that he wants a prize. No, he's writing to encourage them. I mean, after this, we get the great analogy, analogy that those that run a race run all. They finish it. And he's telling them all of this that we just read so that when they run their race, they get the crown. Let me say, it's not about my crown. I want you to get your crown. Everything about his epistles is in service to others. That they live the life before Christ that God would be pleased with. That they go out and win those that God purposed for them to go out and win. He writes all these out of love, out of compassion, because God revealed unto the Apostle Paul what others needed, and he put pen to paper and wrote what God gave them to write back so that what they needed was satisfied in Christ. Because I and the flesh can try and serve you, try to meet a need, but I'm limited by what I can do. But in service to others through God, I may not be able to meet it. But if God reveals what you need, He may give me a thought and a lesson. He may give me a verse that I do a devotion on that I never know that that's what you needed, but God can fill it. Could the Apostle Paul heal people? No, nope, but God could through the Apostle Paul. So this entire passage that we've read is about service and into others. That by serving Christ, we will need to serve others because you can't be in the will of God without serving others. It is the will of God that we go. Go to what? Serve the will of God by getting the gospel out. What is the gospel? Serving the needs of others. They need a Savior. We know who it is. But look with me, if you will. Verse number 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. He's saying, I hope and pray that they're all my service. Some get saved. But he's saying, even if nobody does, I'm still going to do it. Because it's right in the eyes of God. Show me one person that Jesus touched, that he didn't serve. Even those that came to him and rejected him, like the rich young ruler, Jesus gave him everything he needed. That man rejected. 
Even at the Last Supper, Jesus broke the bread and served others. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Why? Because he's the one serving it. He gets down to wash Peter's feet, and Peter said, Lord, I, I'm not worried. He said, if I don't wash your feet, can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said, hey, watch all of me. Why are we stopping at the feet? Everything Christ did was in service, one, to the Father, but two, to the spiritual needs of others. So with all that in mind, we want to teach on this morning, serving all. Not some, all. Because the Apostle Paul said that I am become all things to all men. How do you serve all? Well, first off, it starts internally. We've already alluded to this. How can you serve someone else if you don't know what they need? How can you know what somebody else needs unless God gives it to you? Now, here's the thing. God may not explain why they need it. It is not your job to be Holy Ghost Junior. But if God lays on your heart, hey, give that person a telephone call. Hey, take that person out to lunch. Hey, when you're out doing your shopping, grab a few things and take it to this person's house. Hey, when you're praying tonight, pray for this person. Why, Lord? Not my job. I think I told on that one time. Outside of your jurisdiction. You don't need to know that. You don't need to know why. You just need to know, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. I can serve without knowing why that person needs it. For instance, anybody ever been to a restaurant? And your waiter gets a little bit busy, so they send somebody to your table with silverware or with a drink or something else. They may have called something back into the, you know, an appetizer or something. And the person who put the order in, they're too swamped with the kids crying and throwing a whole bunch of stuff over on the other tables. And people saying, well, I want a new dish. So they send somebody. That person doesn't know what you ordered. They just know they're supposed to take this to this. And if they do it, your needs are still satisfied. But that person who delivered it, they don't know. The mailman has no idea what he's bringing you in the mailbox each day. That's why they say, don't shoot the messenger. But every now and then, you get something good in the mail. You don't thank the mailman. You thank the one who sent it. The Apostle Paul is saying, I don't need the thanks. I just want to be the one who delivers it. But how do you first come to understand what other people need? Through much prayer. Through much supplication with the Lord. Lord, show me someone that needs you and show me what I can do. Because you can watch all the videos on YouTube and all these other websites where they say that they can teach you stuff and you can tune in. I don't know if you guys see those ads on YouTube, but I do. Hey, watch Harvard Lectures. Now I'm good. Why? Because they're ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. There's a lot of things out there that in the realm of psychology and philosophy that people claim can help you and you can study it all day long but really, even those with those education, what do they need in order to get a glimpse into somebody else? They've got to sit down and talk to them for about 20 hours before they finally come up with an idea on how to help them. And most of the time, people that go to therapists, what do they say? Well, that's your time. Thanks for coming in. I was here to listen. You're paying them to listen. You're not paying them for advice. Yeah. Well, what's the contrast to that? Well, I... I can sit down and listen to you all day long. I may have ideas. I don't know if they're going to work for you. Well, hey, I don't know because I've never been in that situation, but could do one of these things. I don't know. Was well, it going to work? I don't know. Never done it. Or if I have, it didn't work out for me. It might work out for you. You don't want that. What do you want? You want to be able to go to somebody. Never even mention... How you found out, hey, I want to be a blessing to you. God told me to do this for you. Have a great day. I'm out of the picture. Well, how was that revealed to me? One, prayer and supplication. Two, you've got to be sensitive to the Spirit. You don't think that the Apostle Paul labored and spiritually sweat over the words that he pinned down to these churches? He even tells them, 
The, the words that he's writing, they come from God. These are the very words of God that he's delivering to other people. You're telling me that he wasn't meticulous about that? Well, how did he become meticulous? Lord, what do you want me to write? Lord, should I say it this way or should I say it that way? Because I can say it either way, but they may take it different on the other end. He was directed, he served the Lord, but he was steered by the Spirit. You can try and serve others, but unless the Holy Ghost is the one directing you, you're liable to do a whole lot more harm than you do good. There's one thing to say a word, it's another thing to say a word fitly spoken. You can say something that's meant to be comforting and somebody else receive it in a belittling manner. You ever, you know, pay somebody a compliment and then they say, well, what's that supposed to mean? It means that I liked your outfit today. Why are you all offensive all of a sudden? Or defensive all of a sudden? How did I offend you with a compliment? Right, but there are people that, that's happened. They're always on guard. They're always looking to lash out at somebody else. But, Lord, what do I do? If the Lord just tells you, say, hey, been thinking about you. Walk away. Do it. No more, no less. Because a word fitly spoken is more valuable than, what was it? Golden apples and silver frames. Silver pictures. What's that mean? Doesn't take a lot. Just takes the right thing. I don't know what that is. God does. But see, if I'm serving others, I care more about how they receive it. I care more about what it can do than I care about the inconvenience to me. And really, it's not an inconvenience to my soul. It's an inconvenience to the flesh. Service to others means their needs are more important than my needs. But you can serve all that way. When you take the blinders off instead of just saying, well, Lord, what do you want me to do at church? How about, hey, Lord, what do you want me to do in between Sunday morning and Sunday evening? Lord, what do you want me to do Sunday night? I mean, I've said this before. Some people looked at me like I was crazy. Lord, which drive through you want me to go through today for lunch? Because there may be somebody at that drive through that needs to hear about Jesus. And at this drive through that you normally would have gone through, God's not working on that person's heart. God's not ready to plant or water in that field. But over here, you don't know it. That person's received three tracks this week, and they're just waiting for somebody to ask them, hey, you want to know about Jesus? Because they don't know where to look. They don't know where to go. But God wants to send you by that way. You say, that doesn't happen. I can't prove to you that it does, but I can prove to you that one day on the road, Paul's just on his way to Damascus. But well, then he meets Jesus. Jesus sends him down onto Damascus anyway. But he sends him to a guy named Simon's house. Well, what's that? Well, I mean, literally, the apostle is blind. It's just like he's pulling up in the drive through Simon knows who he is. He's saying, man, this is the guy that's trying to kill us. Lord, why do you want me to go through that drive through But what does Simon end up doing? He ends up teaching the apostle Paul the doctrines of the faith. And then when he gets back, I mean, eventually scales fall off his eye. He gets back to Jerusalem with the other apostles, and they're all like, hey, we know who you are. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not Saul no more, I'm Paul. He says, God done a little bit of work in me. Let me tell you about it. All oh, why? Because one person was willing to go to the place that was uncomfortable. Really, he didn't have to go anywhere. God sent him to Simon's house. What's he doing? He's sitting there. He's saying, okay, Lord, I'll serve. Why? Because the fear of the Pharisee that had the writ in his hand to go and persecute the church. He's saying, if God wants me to teach him about Jesus, I'll teach him about Jesus. If God wants me to minister to him, to serve him, I'll do it. That's why people are still talking about the Samaritan. Why? Because even though it was inconvenient, even though it cost him out of his own pocketbook, and he was willing to give more when he came back through, if the bill was even more, he bound up the man's he poured oil in, he cleaned him out, he got him to a place where he could rest. Why do people still talk about that story? Because that was a Samaritan. That was one that didn't belong in the culture. And he said, even though that guy doesn't like me, 
Even though that man normally wouldn't talk to me. Even though that man wouldn't even, you know, spit on me if I was on fire. I'm going to take care of his needs because it's the right thing to do. The Samaritans were half-breeds. Jesus said, I must need to go through Samaria. And the disciples looked at him like he was nuts. It's like saying, I'm going to go through the war zone because that's how the Jews saw him. No, no, no. Those people, they'll defile you. Those people, you have, if you go talk to them, you've got to go make a sacrifice in the temple. That's how they viewed it. Because they were unclean. Well, Jesus said, i got to go that way. And it's not like he met the mayor of the town. It's not like he met the most clean-cut person of the city. It's not like he met the pinnacle of Samaritans. No, he met the woman who had to go get water at midday. Because she had had a whole bunch of husbands. The one that she was with wasn't her husband. Everybody in town knew how wicked this lady was. And she came running into town and said, Hey, let me tell you all about this guy that I met at the well. Jesus had to go through some area for that woman. A lot of illustration, but even a Samaritan who knew that's how the Jews viewed him saw a Jew on the side of the road and said, I'll serve him. Why did Jesus give that illustration? Because there are going to be days that you're looking at somebody that you know hates you or disdains you. But see, you're not serving them. You're serving God. Because through God, you can serve all. I can't serve that person. Because to serve, you have to do it with their best interest in mind. In the flesh, you can't serve somebody that hates you genuinely, authentically. Because all the while, you're thinking, man, I want to put something in this guy's food. All the while, you're thinking, all right, I'm going to serve him. Then I'm going to hold it over his head for a long time. Right? I'm going to use this to get even. I'm going to kill him with kindness. No. Why? Because all of those, there's animosity, there's hate, there's a whole lot of sin in there. And where's it all stem from? Based off of what they think of me. I mean, Brother Greg Phillips has said it all the time, he that angers you controls you. Because you're living the life to try and prove the one that hates you wrong. Or the one that makes you angry wrong. But what if trying to prove that person wrong leads you outside of the will of God we never think about that when we're angry but in service I don't care what they think about me in fact the less they think about me the better because they might see Jesus instead maybe it's your selfless and sincere act that God's going to use to show that person you know what I was very wrong about them and you say oh, that's easy to say brother Jordan oh I know trust me I'm the guy that doesn't, you know, like end relationship. I burn bridges. And you can't put them back together after I've burned them. Right? Like one time, I'm done, I'm done. Right? You do me wrong, fine. Have a good life. Right? That's how I am in the flesh. I learned it from my mom. And if you don't believe me, if any of you have ever gotten a cold shoulder from her, you know. Am I right, Brother Randy? Yep. <laughs> She doesn't have a cold shoulder. She has a, you now have a cold life. Right? And what's she do? She doesn't say anything. She doesn't talk to you. She cuts you out. Right? And in the stillness, there's a loud thing that says, I'm not happy with what you did. Even though she didn't say a word. But that's how, in the flesh, I handle situations. Okay. You're dead to me. But what if, in the Spirit, God says, go mend that bridge? They, well, wait, hang on a second, Lord. They did me wrong. I did the right thing by burning the bridge. By mending the bridge, you're admitting that you were wrong. You shouldn't have burned it. You willing to do that to serve somebody else? In service to God, you can serve all. Because in service to what I think, I'm not going to rebuild that bridge. In service to who I think I should reach, I may go and try and build another bridge, but that bridge is never going to get completed because I'm trying to do it. Like Jonah, Lord, I want to go build this bridge. No, no, no. You've got to go mend that bridge that you burned. 
No, you've got to go use that bridge that you don't want to use. The one that you've put up signs for other people saying, hey, don't go that way. There's a crazy person lives on the other side of that bridge. You've got to go use that bridge. You've got to go talk to one that in your mind you think is the troll that lives under the bridge. You've got to go serve that person today. Well, the Apostle Paul did. But how can you say that? Because the Philippian jailer got saved. Paul didn't care about that man. He'd have let that man take his own life. Paul didn't care about that man and his family getting saved. We wouldn't have one book of the Bible. If he'd have said, no, that man beat me a few hours ago. I'm not going to serve him. But nope. I mean, Paul was in the middle of the inner prison. He couldn't see what that guy was doing. Holy Spirit told him, hey, tell that guy not to take his life. Paul said, okay. Maybe he was still in the middle of singing. I don't know. Because it says that they prayed and they sang songs at midnight. Maybe at, through the earthquake, maybe they didn't even feel it. They just saw in the Lord that they're just worshiping. And then, out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit says, hey, yell out to the jailer and say, hey, we're all here. Paul didn't even hesitate. Because if he would have, the guy would have already taken his life. What's that an example of? It's one of the things that in the flesh, I'd have burned the bridge. I wouldn't have cared. I'd like to think that I would have. But who knows? Never been in that situation. But if I'm focused on this rather than that, not serving. If I care more about what I feel rather than what somebody else needs, I can't serve all. But the Apostle Paul says, I became all to all men. Meaning, I put myself in their shoes. I became as weak so that I would understand how that person feels. And when I came with the gospel, I understood how badly they needed it. It's one thing just to hand out a track knowing that somebody out there is lost. It's another thing to know that that's the thing that that person needs to avoid dying and going to hell. Then maybe before you hand them out, you're going to pray over them. Say, Lord, show me who to give these to. Lord, I've got this track. I've got this track. I've got which one should I give to the people that I hand them out to? Because they all talk about Jesus, but each one of them talk about a different part of Jesus. Show you a different thing that Jesus can do for you. What's that? Lord, put me in their shoes and show me what they need. Show me how badly they want the truth. And Lord, I'll sincerely, maybe I'll go a little bit further if I know how bad they need it. Maybe if I know how bad they're hurting, I'll spend a little bit extra time or a little bit extra money. Or I'll invest a little bit more in that person knowing how badly they're hurting, how badly they need. The Apostle Paul said, Lord, make me in my heart as broken as that person so that I can understand it. Lord, remind me of the time that I was so heartbroken that I didn't even want to get up out of bed in the morning. So that when I go and tell that person that you're the mender of broken things, that you're the potter that can take those broken pieces and put them back together, that, Lord, I say it with sincerity. I want to serve others, so make me as others so that I know how best to serve them. Really what the Apostle Paul is saying here is, Lord, give me their pain so that I've got a burden for them. A lot of people are willing to go out and help pain. But what if in order to help pain, you have to first feel the pain? You can serve all, but are you willing to? Because to serve some, you're going to have to hurt. Maybe it's the hurt that you've... God's already taken it away from you. But you have to ask God, Lord, remind me how that felt. Lord, it's been so long that I've forgotten that you know, where you found me from, Lord, show me again. Yeah. Bring it to my remembrance so that I can get the burden to go back to those that are still there. What was the Apostle Paul's biggest burden for the people of Israel? He said that he would die and be a curse, spend all of eternity in hell if Israel could get saved. 
And yet, where did the Lord send them? Everywhere but Israel. There were 11 other apostles that God said, they're serving in Jerusalem. They're serving among your brethren. I want you to go serve these others. Sometimes in service at all, we've got to put our own personal pain on the side burner. If you really believe God can help all those other people with their pain, can't God help you with yours? Maybe it's going to be the Philippian jailer that took him back to his house that night, dressed his wounds, took care of him. Maybe it's going to be the fact that, well, Lord, I've been in the storm for 14 days and I've been thrown up over the side of the boat the whole time. And then the Lord talks to you. And Lord, I told him we shouldn't have even been on the boat. Why are we out here in the middle of the water right now, Lord? God says, don't tell them that as long as nobody jumps off the boat, everybody's going to make it through it. No, Lord, they deserve to. Be, I told them not to. Kill them. Now he just came out and said, hey, told y'all we shouldn't have launched. Y'all didn't listen to me then. Listen to me now. Nobody gets off the boat. We all make it, but the boat's not going to make it. They said, okay. Well, actually, the centurion said, do what that guy said. And then everybody else did it. Then they get to the island. Thank you, Lord, for, for getting here. Bit by a snake. Just shook it off. And in the middle of it, those guys started to try and worship him. And see, Apostle Paul was over there trying to kill the snake to bit him. God may have kept him from getting killed by this venomous snake. But if he's over there worried about that, he's not sensitive to understand, oh, those people are going to start worshiping. No, 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 not Paul, the God that Paul serves. Same thing over in Athens where they thought that he was one of the great gods. Now you say, all this, what? Serving others. I mean, even though those people didn't listen to you the first time or the second time or the third time, go back and tell them again if God tells you to. You may have been snake bit, but you got to put that pain aside to help those barbarians that don't know any better. Maybe, even though you've just gotten through that storm, you've survived being bit by a venomous snake, you eventually make it to Rome, now what? Well, you're still captive, but the centurion was burdened to give you a little house and keep you there for a while. He's having to worry about go before Caesar a few t different times, by the way. He's worried about, well, Lord, what do you want me to tell Caesar? But all the while, there are people coming to his house. God told him, hey, Paul, you've got to stand before Caesar. God didn't tell him about all the other people that would be knocking on his door. We get so focused on, well, God told me I had to stand before Caesar. I've got to get the words perfect so that when I go before Caesar, everything's going to be okay. Don't bother me right now. Quick knocking on the door. How many people in Rome wouldn't have got saved? Lord, give me the broken heart of those that I've never even met before so that when they come, I know what you want me to tell them. That's a hard prayer to pray. I dare say just about as hard as, Lord, give me patience. But through that prayer, we can serve all. How do you think the Apostle Paul wrote, Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Because he's saying, I've junked all of Paul so that Christ can do what Christ wants to do with Paul. He's saying, I don't even really focus on my pain, because the Lord said he'd take care of my needs. He prayed three times for the thorn to be removed. Then what happened? He accepted it and embraced it. He said, okay, God wants me to have it. So if God hasn't taken this pain from me, God wants me to have it. And if God gave it to me, he's going to provide where I can live with it. What's that mean? It frees me up to care about others instead of myself. Except the emotional pain. The stress. The burden and trust that God's yoked up with you and pulling the load with you and won't put more on you than that which you're able to bear and now I can focus on well Lord why are we plowing this field where do you want me to drop some of that seed in one of these rows while we're plowing Lord where do you want me to water some along the way Lord who do you want me while we're plowing to just reach out and say hey Jesus loves you I care about you if you need anything let me know 
because if I'm focused on the burden, I'm not serving. I'm barely even being obedient. Because all the while I'm pulling the load, I'm hating the fact that I am pulling the load. But in complete service to God, I can serve all. But it's one thing to say, I want to serve others, and it's another thing to say, Lord, prepare me to serve others. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.